Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Fintech Fair presents India and China Fintech at the time of uh, COVID-19. Uh, we bring this presentation to you with our knowledge partners, Medici, and our diamond sponsors, Invest Hong Kong. Thank you all for uh, joining in uh, across uh, Asia. We've had a lot of signups from everywhere, and we look forward to presenting a good thought leadership uh, webinar to you where we're speaking about uh, what is the state of fintech in India and China. We'll also look at uh, Medici presenting about interesting insights over the last year in the field. And lastly, we'll be talking, uh, which will be the main uh, webinar, uh, which will be the panel discussion with thought leaders from both India and China and Hong Kong uh, discussing the state of play in the market. My name is Mushir Ahmed. I am uh, founder of FinStep Asia and co-founder of the Virtual Fintech Fair. In addition to that, I'm also a co-founder of the Fintech Association of Hong Kong and India Tech Hong Kong. Uh, today, we will start off with uh, a presentation and discussion on uh, the Indian and Chinese uh, Fintech ecosystem and a brief introduction to the Virtual Fintech Fair by me. Um, just give me a second and we can get to that. So when we look at the Indian ecosystem, as most of you may, will be aware, we have uh, 1.3 billion people with over uh, 440 million uh, millennials, uh, for close to 400 million generation Zers, right? Uh, India's GDP is expected to grow between six to 8%. And we've seen that the internet users will uh, reach, uh, was expected to reach 720 million by end of 2019. And uh, we have seen that it has actually now reached about 750 million, half of which are from rural India. Uh, rural India is the fastest growing internet market uh, for India, largely driven by players like Jio. Uh, India is the third largest global startup ecosystem and uh, provides an employment to uh, over 200,000 people as per the statistics we have. In addition, the digital payment sector in India is estimated to grow to over 1 trillion US dollars, uh, which is uh, going up almost 20 times from what the value was in 2017. Interesting note from uh, the wealth management side is that only 2% of India invests in market traded securities and only 12% actively use online banking. So there's a big opportunity there. While financial services is likely to grow at two and a half times the real GDP. So FinTech can be looking at a growth sector in the coming, uh, coming years. Uh, and of course, uh, India and China jointly have the highest FinTech adoption as per the EY adoption index uh, for last year. Now, a snapshot of the Indian startup ecosystem. We have, uh, as I said, close to about uh, 9,000 startups were uh, initiated during uh, the last five years. And uh, you're seeing that in 2019, there were uh, close to 1,500 startups that came about, including seven unicorns with funding of uh, close to $5 billion. Uh, Indian unicorns, as you can see, uh, India has now the third number uh, of, uh, third number in terms of number of unicorns uh, globally after the US and China with 18 unicorns out of the 250 globally, right? And here's a snapshot of the ones that have been uh, growing. This is across sectors, including FinTech. Um, now, a lot of India's uh, FinTech has grown uh, based on a unique infrastructure built by the government uh, known as the India Stack. Uh, the India Stack provides uh, an ID a technology layer of which uh, on which a lot of uh, different services can be built. Number one being the Aadhaar universal ID system, which has over 1.2 billion Indians uh, having given their biometric details and mapped on that. Uh, secondly is the DigiLocker. Then comes UPI, uh, one of the world's foremost payments interface, uh, which now is transacting billions of dollars on a monthly basis and uh, is the backbone of the Indian FinTech and uh, payments ecosystem. Uh, E-Sign, any KYC or other enablers for the uh, ecosystem based on India stack. This is a snapshot of the Indian uh, fintech market. Payments and lending tend to lead the way. Uh, however, uh, wealth tech and uh, B2B solutions are also becoming very important in the coming days. Um, this is uh, a number of fintech startups that uh, came about uh, in the last few years. As you can see, quite a bit of growth uh, in India after the US and China. And uh, by segments, uh, payment, lending, and wealth tech are leading the way. Main uh, uh, regions for fintech would be Bangalore, uh, which is the tech uh, capital, followed by Mumbai, the financial capital, and then the what we call what is known as the 
national capital region near New Delhi, including Gurugram and Noida. A lot of Indian startups are keen to expand globally, and uh, you can see that over 90% of Indian startups, when they from day one, are targeting not just the Indian market but a global market as well. Coming to the Chinese ecosystem, uh, as we know, the world's most populous ecosystem with the highest number of internet users, close to 900 million uh, internet users and 850 million smartphones, uh, highest in the world. Uh, the number of rural internet users are comparatively lesser though, and but it's expected to grow in the coming months with a big focus on the, on the rural uh, part of China, especially the Western half of the country, which is uh, not as uh, developed as the rest of the country. 90% uh, of payments in China are facilitated via mobile payments uh, and about 600 million people are using uh, you know, mobile for making payments, which is a significantly uh, big number. And uh, the value of the China's mobile payment is $40 trillion, which is uh, over uh, 25 times the US uh, payment ecosystem, largely because uh, uh, the 90% of payments going through mobile uh, platforms. Uh, in addition, Subjects and uh, activities such as uh, Jerry.com's uh, recent uh, um, Singles Day and uh, Valentine's Day uh, sales for the Chinese Valentine's Day sale, as well as the 11-11 sales by Alibaba are uh, big factors in driving e-commerce um, in uh, China, which is again run largely through the mobile phones. Uh, they have more than 7 trillion of investable wealth currently, which is on low interest rate, but that's an area that we see growing. Um, People buying financial products in China has also grown to over uh, 120 million p uh, over the last year and expected to continue to grow as more people are comfortable buying and purchasing products online, especially financial products. Internet penetration, we've already touched on this. One interesting statistics on the Chinese uh, internet startups is 46% of them make uh, unicorn status within two years with an average time of four years, which is uh, less than half of what uh, happens in the US. Uh, uh, interesting note, uh, as you may have heard, and financial, the world's most valuable uh, unicorn uh, with valuation between 150 to $2 billion, uh, $200 billion is uh, looking to list uh, soon. Uh, this is according to Reuters, and this may happen on the Hong Kong exchange in the coming days. Uh, now, as I mentioned, and financial uh, comes out of uh, Alibaba, basically it was created to facilitate e-commerce transactions for uh, Alibaba in the mid 2000s and uh, started off with Alipay and now covers a whole gamut of services from money market funds to insurance to lending as well as digital banking. Tencent and Baidu have also gotten into the same space. And in the recent past, uh, Jingdong.com, so JD.com have also got into it. While another big player in the FinTech space would be Pingan, who started off as a large insurance player, but now offer quite a few technology services uh, on, on top of that. China is a largely cashless economy, especially in the urban world, where 84% uh, of people are very comfortable going out without cash. Uh, about 70% say they can survive with less than 100 uh, renminbi. Works out to be about 15 US dollars uh, for uh, nearly a month, right? Uh, which is remarkable. The payment market is largely split between Alibaba and WeChat, uh, with uh, WeChat having uh, a lot of uh, growth in the recent past as compared to Alibaba largely because Beach uh, started around 2013-14, leveraging off the ELIC program, which was uh, initiated in 2013, which got them the big growth uh, in their numbers. Now, uh, we would like to quickly brief you on the virtual fintech fair before I hand over to Ahmed to give us an overview of the current fintech landscape in uh, Asia and the scenario this year. The virtual fintech fair is Asia's premier virtual fintech fair, which is brought to you by FinStep Asia and Nofsphere Media. Uh, we are, it is a two-day event, which we are uh, looking to connect startups from India, China, Hong Kong, and other countries within the region, including ASEAN, India, uh, and uh, the Middle East. Uh, we have, uh, we're looking to have more than 3,000 delegates, globally renowned speakers, 50 startups, and we already have delegates from over 60 countries who have registered on our uh, platform over the past month. Uh, some key thought leaders for your uh, reference, uh, ranging from uh, big firms uh, such as IBM, Citibank, HSBC, all the way to uh, young promising uh, fintechs uh, in terms of uh, unicorns, et cetera. 
uh, including uh, Tonic Bank, um, and we have the likes of Jumio, uh, and uh, we have players uh, from Middle East uh, and Thailand as well. Here's a quick look at our agenda. Um, our agenda is focused on uh, eight themes across fintech. Uh, we're looking to cover subjects such as AI and big data, look at regulations and rec tech, uh, insure tech, look at talent, uh, digital assets and blockchain. Of course, payments and wealth is a major uh, part of what we talk about. Uh, and uh, we are discussing Islamic fintech and the growth of fintech in the Middle East. This will be a fully uh, virtual experience uh, via a world leading uh, virtual platform. Uh, you'll, be ha you'll be able to have an immersive experience as attendees where you can go and uh, see the conference, but also interact with uh, innovative companies from across the region, uh, be able to chat with them or via text or uh, video uh, interface as well. And you'll also be able to um, do uh, interaction with each other or in the lounge. Uh, just a snapshot of how the interface will look. Uh, this will be how the lobby will look. And we'll have the exposure for all of our uh, sponsors uh, and uh, different elements of where you can go uh, on the um, exhibition. This is the lounge uh, where people can interact and discuss with each other and uh, go to different parts of the event. This is how some of the booths will uh, look when you head over. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, these are our uh, variety of partners, uh, available partners across uh, Asia who have uh, supporting our event and beyond, uh, including the partners of uh, over 15 fintech associations in the region. Our lead diamond partners are Invest Hong Kong and Fintech HK. And our session sponsors are Jumio, with knowledge partners being Medici and other PR partners at Cognito and at Factors. Um, and uh, our media partners at uh, Jumpstart and Zenith Media. Thank you so much for your time and listening in. I will be back uh, with the discussion uh, for the panel discussion. And I would now hand over to Mr. Amit Goel, founder of uh, Medici, and uh, who will be speaking on the Asian landscape in the last six months. Amit, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Mushir. Always a pleasure. Let me just share my uh, screen. You can see my screen, right? Okay. So it's always fascinating to talk about, uh, you know, Asia FinTech. Um, it, uh, Asia has a bunch of frontier fintech markets today, uh, you know, uh, which we'll be talking about, uh, I'll be talking about in this presentation. Um, the way that everybody else outside Asia is looking at, you know, how sort of fintech is evolving is, is great. I mean, it's happening across technology markets, but specifically in fintech, it's been a, it's been a major trend uh, that sort of, you know, Asian, uh, fintech innovation is kind of leading. Um, if you look at China, how the social life, financial life, and uh, retail life of a person has sort of converged in a super app seamlessly, uh, you know, is kind of setting standards for everyone else uh, globally. And um, it is also now quite evident from the data that we see on the Medici platform. So we track about 14,000 fintech startups and um, some of the finest financial services experiences today being benchmarked globally are actually coming from, uh, from Asia. And that's why I think there's an explosion of, um, uh, you know, FinTech startups uh, in the region. So this is uh, coming from our Medici platform. And uh, we basically are looking at, uh, at this chart where it shows the number of FinTech startups which are there uh, currently, uh, you know, across different regions. So as you can see, right, uh, you know, about six, seven years back when we started tracking, uh, you know, the startups on the platform, Asia was quite small, uh, almost uh, sort of half the size. America was uh, kind of, you know, even at that time was around uh, sort of 3000 startups. So Asia, the number of new FinTech startups that have come up is, is really phenomenal. And in case you were thinking like, where is this data coming from? I just wanted to quickly show you um, that, you know, this is the Medici platform. We basically have, the startup scanner. So we track about, uh, you know, 14,000 startups and with a lot of filters. So I have basically taken data from, from this, uh, to kind of show you today, uh, sort of, you know, how, uh, the landscape looks like, um, there is, there's one more very interesting thing that we have to look at when it comes to Asia, right. Um, 
uh, often the role of re regulators is uh, not talked about as much, but I think the Asian regulators have done a great job in terms of deregulation or sort of bringing in better regulations, right? So what I mean by that is I'll give you four examples. Um, they, they are actually looking at how we can bring in technology to better financial services for the customer, but at the same time, the transactions have to be secure and, and, and fast in real time. So what they have done is uh, four things. One, uh, different sort of regions are working on a version of open banking. Uh, some of them through mandate, through a regulation like in Hong Kong, uh, you know, or Australia or South Korea, and some of them are mostly market driven, like it is in China or India. And uh, second thing which is happening is in terms of the licenses, right? So a lot of these countries, uh, which we'll talk about in the virtual banking section in this, in this deck are opening up new digital only bank licenses, right? So this is uh, going to help a lot in bringing in new players uh, and providing some competition to the incumbents, right? The other thing is uh, the basic sort of infrastructure. Say, for example, if you look at payments in countries like India, they have opened up the complete payment stack uh, so that any third party uh, you know, or any technology company can actually build on that and provide better experiences. So uh, the opening up of infrastructure is a big theme in Asia. And then finally, I would say it is also going to very niche areas. Like if you see transit payments, which is a huge opportunity, right? Equivalent to almost retail payments opportunity. There as well, um, the stack is opening up, the infrastructure is being opened up so that more and more players can actually participate in the market. And that's why you see in different parts uh, of Asia, you see ride hailing companies, you see, uh, you know, companies like, uh, you know, coming from e-commerce and, and social back background uh, to even uh, companies coming from other consumer tech or other consumer fields, being able to now participate and, and kind of, you know, provide financial services using technology to, uh, to the customer. So, the role of regulators should not be neglected in terms of whether it be uh, opening up the licenses or open banking or open transit payments or opening up the payments infrastructure. So what is the result of that, right? So the result of that is um, that today, uh, if you look at it, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, sort of fintech startups which are there in, in, in different countries uh, within Asia, right? So uh, China, of course, you know, uh, is leading the pack. Uh, it's a frontier nation as far as fintech is concerned globally. India has more than 2,000 fintech startups, as you can see here. What I've also done is I have put a few segments which are kind of leading in, in these countries. Um, Hong Kong has more than 200 startups. Singapore has more than 500 startups. Indonesia is coming up really well. A very large market with a lot of infrastructure development happening. You know, 300 plus uh, uh, fintech startups. And the reason for that is, as I was explaining earlier, the opening up, the, the deregulation and you know, making it easier for new players to enter in. Now let's look at, um, uh, you know, the, the trend in terms of funding. So we basically track funding on an ongoing basis, almost on a daily hourly basis for these 14,000 companies. So this is a quick snapshot of, uh, from January to June. Um, now, in terms of the COVID-19 impact, let's start there. Uh, you know, you would imagine that um, uh, there's, there's going to be a lot of impact, but we have not largely seen that typically 3.3 or 3.4 billion dollars average monthly um, in uh, fintech uh, funding happens globally in this space. Um, and we have seen uh, in the last six months uh, on an average, it has been around the average. It's been a little bit up, a little bit down in a few months, but we have not seen a very sort of drastic downfall in terms of funding. So that's good news. You know, the uh, especially if you look at global, uh, I think US is still very strong, US, UK, uh, in Asia, India and Singapore are kind of uh, the ones which have uh, really, really sort of, um, uh, you know, the companies have been able to raise a lot of money during the last six months. The only, um, the only dampener we have seen is in terms of China. Uh, so China, the fintech funding has actually gone down drastically over the last six months. It used to kind of lead the pack globally and certainly in Asia. Um, in fact, in June, there were like, you know, only a handful or, you know, just, just like a couple of deals which happened, which is usually, you know, in tens and hundreds. So, so that's, that's kind of an outlier, but otherwise, as I said, FinTech funding has not really taken a big beating, but you have to also look at, you know, uh, sort of studying FinTech funding and understanding the kind of analysis is uh, very nuanced because um, the COVID-19 impact might actually start appearing uh, from now onwards, right? So, a lot of these deals that you are seeing actually happened in, uh, say, you know, the last two quarters of the last year, and and in January, February, 
and and since then uh, you know all the different steps in terms of negotiations and uh, uh, you know due diligence have happened so these deals are actually not really reflective of the covid 19 impact so we we will see as we go forward we continuously track and publish this data um as i was talking about virtual banking or open banking right uh, virtual banking or digital only banks um, i think these are the uh, you know five countries uh, where a lot of action is happening uh, you know obviously hong kong uh seems to be paying the most amount of attention they issued eight licenses um followed by south korea and taiwan uh, where three licenses have been issued so far and and then philippines uh, one and then singapore is actually sort of coming up with uh, licenses in which uh, out of five two of them are for both retail and, and corporate customers now a special mention for hong kong because you know i think they have really gone ahead and and uh, you know sort of uh brought like these eight uh, licenses in place and then a bunch of them have actually launched uh, so two i think two or three of them have launched two two of them are in beta phase and and some of them are still in stealth but this is providing ample amount of uh, competition in the market and we are already seeing like you know better uh, sort of interest rates or reduce um, minimum deposits and and you know reduce fees and stuff like that in the market which is kind of you know always um, always good to have uh, more competition in the market um i think uh, what is also happening apart from this is uh, and, and you know just last few thoughts uh, i wanted to keep it brief is that there's a lot of unbundling uh, which happened in the last 6 7 years in fintech and right now there's a growing trend of rebundling uh, where Uh, you know a lot of fintech companies are actually uh, you know even if they started in payments they are adding uh uh you know lending they are also beginning to sell insurance and and mutual funds in fact some of them are going ahead and even uh, you know acquiring licenses in other verticals as well for example you know paytm just got, uh, you know uh, paytm founder and the company also announced that they are going after a, a, a insurance license uh, in india and and we have seen that sort of across the markets uh each of the regional markets is kind of very different for example if you see indonesia very large market lot of competition between uh, two large uh, consumer tech companies gojek and grab um if you look at vietnam growing really really fast lots of new startups coming up the banks and fis are paying a lot of attention to partnering with uh, these tech companies if you look at india the biggest story has been as mushir was talking about how to create um, the financial infrastructure as public goods so that any local or foreign company any any small startup or a bank or a technology company is able to uh, kind of participate in the market and therefore we have seen a lot of very interesting propositions like google pay and phone pay uh, uh, you know in 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 the market um what we are also seeing is like a lot of b2c companies which have grown big are now also bringing in their b2b proposition to help banks and fis so we have seen that with uh, and financial as well as uh, zongen uh, with zedetech and a whole bunch of companies who are bringing b2b uh, propositions to the banks and fis so that you could do say for example 310 kind loans uh, you know to the customers in your region now b2b fintech uh, you know has seen a lot of growth uh, especially in uh, things like digital id or ekyc so during covid 19 a lot of banks and fis want to open uh, accounts uh, digitally and uh, so for digital onboarding Uh, they are really making use of all the ekyc digital id cyber security uh, you know b2b fintech startups which are available um apart from that uh, i think there is a new wave of financial infrastructure api companies uh, for example setu or m2p who are basically helping um, uh, you know a new generation of uh, fintech companies or consumer tech companies to issue credit cards uh, using apis right so a lot of work is around how can you sort of demystify and declutter and and make it easy uh, for any new company to offer you know fintech functionality um, by not going directly to the bank but working with somebody sort of in the middle right it used to be visa mastercard in the past but now there is a whole new generation of companies like plaid in the us or you know as i said setu or niam uh, you know in asia which is uh, which is very good i think on the flip side what we are seeing is that the the exits in fintech um you know the acquisitions in fintech in asia have been very slow as compared to uh, as compared to say us us has seen a record number of uh, you know fintech acquisitions including plaid 
uh, by Visa or Finicity by Mastercard and so on and so forth. There has been a lot of activity, or as well as a bunch of IPOs uh, happening in 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 the in the European and American market. So on those two fronts, I think we have seen less. It's not zero. I mean, we there have been um, a bunch of acquisitions that AMTD has made uh, recently, or uh, Air Securities was acquired by Sophie. So there's there's a list of companies, but they're not as big and they're not as many, um, you know, kind of uh, as they used to be. Um, there have been a few like you know, PayU acquired PaySense, uh, you know, and so, so on and so forth. So these are the kind of things that I wanted to share. There's there's always more uh, to to fintech in Asia, but as I said, right, Asia has a whole bunch of frontier fintech markets that everybody is following, and uh, the, just the opening up of the market is fascinating. And um, I think it's um, it really feels very good that um, the world is actually looking at Asia to uh, to learn about fintech. And that will be my last thought. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Amit. I think that was very insightful for all of us to understand about uh, the Asian landscape and where we're going, uh, especially as compared to uh, what's happening um, overseas. Uh, I think the acquisition story is quite interesting and post COVID, it'll also be interesting about how much uh, there is uh, in terms of an acquisition locally in, uh, in Asia, right? Uh, now uh, over to our uh, panel discussion. Uh, very excited to have on board uh, five uh, brilliant speakers uh, and thought leaders uh, from the region um, and uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, each one of them to you. Uh, we have Mr. William Beanbao, who's general partner at SOSV and managing director at China Accelerator. They do a lot of work with uh, fintech companies in Asia, in particular those looking to access uh, China. And uh, this includes a bunch of uh, uh, Indian startups who have uh, taken part uh, in the past few years. Secondly is uh, Ms. Sherry Ngai. She is uh, the manager for uh, Hong Kong Science and Technology Park Corporate Venture Fund and quite actively engaged in the investment landscape in Hong Kong. Third, we have Mr. King Lung. Mr. King Lung is the head of FinTech for Invest Hong Kong and has been a FinTech entrepreneur himself, uh, especially in the insurtech space prior to his role with Invest Hong Kong. Fourthly, Mr. Chandan Joshi, Senior Vice President and Head of Payments at MobiQuick India, one of India's largest payment players. And uh, pr prior to that, Chandan had his own uh, startup uh, in the e-commerce space uh, before uh, he was also a trader in Hong Kong and in India. Last but definitely not the least, Mr. Karthik Prabhakaran, uh, who is Executive Director and Partner at Chirate Ventures, formerly known as IDG uh, India. And they have been very active in the fintech space and one of the premier venture players uh, in Indian fintech. So. Welcome everybody. Uh, great to have you all uh, as part of uh, our uh, session. Um, may I request you to kindly switch on your videos so we can, uh, the audience can have a look at you. Just waiting on William and uh, Chandan. Hey, <clears throat> sorry, uh, can you uh, unblock my video? Is your video unlocked? Uh... Um, I'll just request the Medici team if they're able to unlock his uh, William's video, then. Uh, ah, yes. Perfect, here we have you. Thank you. Great, thank you everyone. Uh, a range and mix of, uh, you know, lockdown versions in different parts of that where we are, right? And the different interactions. Uh, pleasure to have all of you on board. Uh, I will be throwing a bunch of questions. Some I will direct to specific speakers, but I'd also be keen to hear everybody's view as uh, you have them. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of this uh, panel. So we'll keep about 15, 20 minutes to take questions from the audience uh, who have uh, dialed in uh, this evening. So to, to start off with probably this, uh, I will, uh, um, you know, this is open to everybody just to talk about the local markets you're actively engaged in. Um, it's like, what has been the market's initial response to COVID-19? When I say the market, I'm talking about the broader fintech market and the impact, therefore, uh, and what were the key reactions that uh, each of you saw uh, in the industry, right? So we've had, as I said, three different stages and three different uh, impacts of the virus. Uh, we started off with 
uh, the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, originally uh, having an in, in impact in mainland China, then you had it Hong Kong, then things stabilized here. Uh, India, it hit late, but now it's peaking. So very different ways of how the economies have been dealing. So uh, how about we start off with uh, William talking to us about the, you know, the market's initial response to when COVID-19 uh, came to the fore. Sure. Um, so in China, uh, we are first uh, got COVID-19. Uh, most of the people were on vacation anyway with Chinese New Year's, and then there was a delay, uh, people coming back to work. So oftentimes people take two, three weeks, uh, sometimes longer, but two or three week long vacation. Uh, and that was then got extended. Uh, and there was a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, and then um, we're active in Southeast Asia and uh, India, you know, COVID went to Europe, um, but uh, parts of Southeast Asia, South Asia started to get locked down. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we're also active in FinTech in India um, because we had the insights from uh, China. We were able to tell our portfolio companies across Southeast Asia and South Asia, especially on the loan side, uh, to move away from loans uh, and focus a bit more on collections. And also we had a bit of a change where people were adding on uh, healthcare products uh, especially insurance. Um, so for the most part, our portfolio of uh, 20 plus fintechs have nav navigated pretty well. Um, but being nimble was very, very important. Uh, and uh, we're not out of it yet. I mean, we're about to head in, we're in the middle of a, a global recession. Uh, and so it's going to be uh, pretty tough times. Uh, but uh, because uh, digital, everything has gone digital, people accept digital more. Uh, the face-to-face -face relationship is a lot less important now. Uh, so we think that uh, we're going to see a huge acceleration uh, in uh, the fintech space uh, and even from remote payment to, to loans to insurance. Uh, so we're actually pretty positive um, once uh, we get through this recession uh, that fintech is going to be a huge beneficiary of, uh, of this COVID situation. Well, um, just to extend on that, William, uh, you know, the urban part of China, especially East China along the coast has been highly digital. You know, uh, a majority of the internet users are in this belt uh, as we look at it from the center to the east. Um, so with COVID uh, impacting movement of people, right, uh, did, uh, did the fact that a majority of payments are done through mobile, et cetera, help that transformation? Or did you see any subtle changes that also took place on the ground or any transformation on the ground uh, with the broader industry when it came to engaging with fintech or payments, et cetera? No, I mean, nobody here in China uses uh, credit cards or bank cards or even or cash. So everything, all digital, all payment was basically digital um, and uh, already. Um, yeah. What we really saw was uh, a market that's already, you know, 20 plus percent delivery based. Uh, deliveries just went through the roof. I mean, the average person in China gets like 70, 80 deliveries a year. It's almost triple the U.S. Um, and this just extended um, uh, delivery in e-commerce uh, above physical retail. Uh, so we think it's a, it's a pretty big blow to physical retail. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, there's a, you know, we, do, we just saw a huge change. We're now seeing that happen in India. Uh, our portfolio companies uh, are really benefiting from it. Uh, before they were, um, you know, using uh, online payment to send money home. Now, because there's no banks open, there's no ATMs, uh, they still need some cash, uh, and they're using the, the these uh, sort of uh, digital payment uh, platforms to actually withdraw cash, uh, so they can pay for things. Because of the lockdown, they can't actually get out uh, to a bank or to an ATM or to the office or anywhere. Uh, to get cash, so they can just go downstairs to their local market, and uh, we've you know digital payment enabled a lot of these mom and pop shops, uh, so they can do food. Uh, they can also do uh, payment now, so it's a huge acceleration across South Asia. Thanks, William. Moving on to the Indian landscape, uh, Chandan, you've been at the you know at the thick of it. Uh, Mobiquick is one of India's oldest payment players uh, and uh, among the top payment players, uh, and you had the payments for uh, MobiQuick, right? So uh, uh, you've had time to see how things have uh, taken place uh, in mainland China and uh, post that uh, the Indian landscape uh, started, you know, there was a, there's been a gradual move. You of course had the first lockdown in the end of May, which then extended, sorry, end of March, which then extended 
all the way till end of May uh, before being uh, gradually up, uh, cha- uplifted or sorry, lifted rather. Um, what would you say was the initial reaction in India when it came to COVID-19 uh, from a market perspective? And secondly, how has the industry been coping with the changes uh, over the last uh, two, three months? Yeah, sure, uh, Mushe. So, uh, first initial reaction, you know, was of course for shock, I would say, all across. Uh, you know, uh, although it started in China and Hong Kong earlier, so we were expecting it at some point in time, uh, you know, it is going to happen. And a uh, lot of businesses changed, a lot of business uh, practices changed, consumer, uh, you know, customer interests also changed. And all different companies in all different, uh, I would say, sectors, they all reacted, uh, you know, in their own unique ways. And I would say adopted uh, to the new kind of, uh, you know, normal. You know, it's still uh, skyrocketing here in India, although there is no lockdown. But to begin with, the uh, you know, immediate impact of, uh, you know, on payment space, uh, specifically, if we talk about it, the immediate impact on it was from the point of, uh, you know, uh, significant drop in boss business, you know, significant drop in uh, number of transactions across the platforms, I would say, because the people who stopped ordering anything from uh, e-commerce and initial few weeks were uh, there, the services, uh, I would say, uh, home delivery was also not set up and the rules and regulations were not clear in the beginning. So there was a significant drop in terms of, uh, you know, anybody, uh, you know, buying anything. In a matter of seven to 10 days, I would say, uh, you know, things started, uh, you know, being clarified in terms of regulation that how uh, some businesses, essential services effectively can be run, uh, you know, and uh, some practices were uh, effectively uh, communicated clearly by the, by the government. And then uh, businesses started opening up. Uh, and after, I would say, initial week, we also did, uh, you know, uh, completely rewound the app. Uh, you know, we launched a essential services section where we anyway have a, you know, lot of merchants, offline merchants, which we have, uh, you know, who accept payments from, uh, you know, from MovieQuick uh, as a payment option. So they all, st- uh, they are anyway listed on our app, but we brought it all to the front of the app so that when user comes to the app, uh, they can actually order, uh, you know, their essential services, for example, grocery uh, or medicines, you know, or food from their nearest restaurant, which was still operating and willing. So we highlighted those things to the top. Uh, in addition to that, for example, Prime Minister Relief Fund, uh, you know, we brought it to the to the top where people can actually make donations for, uh, you know, Corona. So uh, this was done pretty quickly. And after that, we clearly see a divergence, I would say, in terms of, uh, you know, businesses uh, adapting and uh, adopting and uh, uh, recovering from uh, from this. So, for example, tra- travel was completely shut off, you know, which had a significant, uh, you know, uh, uh, business, uh, uh, you know, business loss. And uh, some of the banks, they changed, it, changed limits for transactions and credit lines and everything for all the risky industries, which were uh, kind of immediately impacted. So that effectively... Uh, created a spiral for some of the companies in, I would say, travel space and food and, uh, you know, retail space. However, there were a few categories which uh, significantly improved in terms of how many transactions were happening. Uh, so, like, for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, grocery services, home delivery services for grocery, uh, you know, medicines, and, uh, of course, education, as we all know, you know, online, uh, sudden interest was there in OTT platforms. So, uh, during this period, uh, so this divergence was there. I would say now, if you think about it today, and of course, different companies, they uh, came up with different practices. So some companies, they immediately, uh, you know, announced pay cuts to cut costs. And, uh, you know, and some companies, uh, you know, effectively got, got rid of people, you know, they fired, let people go as well. Uh, however, we, uh, we didn't do anything like that. And uh, uh, all, in fact, we continued to hire. So around 40 to 50 people, they joined in the last three months who were supposed to join their joining dates were uh, deferred for a bit, but uh, then they eventually did end up, uh, end, up, uh, end up joining. Now, when, when I look back to pre-March, you know, to the March volume and uh, for the month of June, uh, majority of our businesses, they are kind of, uh, you know, just three or four categories which are there. Uh, for example, loan repayment, you know, as uh, William, you were also talking about it. So that is still being impacted because of government moratorium, uh, and people, uh, a lot of people have opted for that, uh, you know, moratorium, and they are not willing to, they are not paying EMIs. Uh, that is until August end. So uh, you know that is all, all going to start in the first week of September, I would say. Uh, that business is going to come back now. 
cab services, Ola and Uber, they are operating. But again, because trend has changed, or most of the companies are still allowing employees to work from home. In fact, we are also working from home. Uh, you know, since uh, I would say 16th of March, uh, and we don't have any plan as of now to you know open our offices as of now. So, uh, uh, so you like uh, cab services, you know, travel. I would say IRCTC, bus bookings, you know, all all restaurants, hotel bookings, all these. This space is still uh, significant, uh, significantly impacted. But good part that we have seen is, uh, you know, there is a strong. Uh, uh, I would say earlier, uh, digital payment was kind of push that we were coming up with ideas. We were trying to incentivize users, and we were pushing that you know you should start paying digitally. However. Uh, during the Im immediate impact of COVID, it has been that, uh, you know, now that the pull from customer is there, you know, people do not want to use cash. So they really are trying to download all the apps and come up with digital uh, mode of payments for all the services. So, you know, that's, uh, the, and that trend, uh, we believe will continue uh, to be there, uh, you know, at least in the foreseeable future. So, yeah. Thanks, uh, Chandan. I think that's, gives a good insight starting from where it was and where it is now we are as you said uh, there's a big push uh, both from the government and the rbi on getting people to uh, uh, in uh, you know uh, actively use digital payments uh, to encourage social distancing as it were uh, with the lockdown ending i think the volumes have started picking back up as well in india um karthik just quickly uh, you know moving to you with regards to you know to continue the conversation on india um uh, anything you would like to add uh, from uh, you know from what Chandan was talking about? I will come to the investment aspect of things uh, later in the conversation. But from a market perspective, from your portfolio companies, uh, what have you been noticing? Sure. So I guess Chandan covered quite quite uh, comprehensively. But just to try and add to that in a, in a small way, I, I think in general, uh, two three significant things that uh, we have noticed in our portfolio. Uh, one is clearly in the lending space. Uh, it's an overhang from last year of the financial uh, industry itself having an overhang from that. But the good part is some of the lending companies have been cautious because of that. So it's less about COVID, but because of how the financial industry has been progressing, where some of them have been pretty cautious in terms of collections and focusing extensively on collections. So what we have seen is some such lending companies have been able to pull back and collect and sit on cash right now. So the flip side of that is loans are not easily available uh, and there is no demand as well, but one is sitting on cash uh, and liquidity to essentially see where consumption kind of starts off. That's one. The second thing is, you know, while there was a significant dip in consumption, and it still is picking up. Some One small metric is we actually tried to do that analysis of how businesses have picked up across segments and across sectors, which is a proxy for payments as well. Across more than 50 of our portfolio companies, when I look at it, uh, most the combined revenues is actually almost back to 80% of what it was in March. So what one was expecting that the recovery will be much, much longer. There are some early green shoots that it may actually be sooner, but obviously subject to maybe a second wave and so many things which are impacting. The third part, which I would like to highlight is how the digital payments actually picked up. And just one small data point was, I think May, the UPI payments were actually 30% higher than what it was in March or April. So clear shift to that and even the urban consumer uh, who would otherwise use a credit card is actually resorting to QR codes and UPI payments, which is actually a good sign, which is only going to take it to the next level in terms of the nook and corner of the country on digital payments. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Those three parts are quite important. Uh, digital payments, I think one of the other elements, as I've mentioned in the presentation was uh, internet users, right? We've doubled that uh, over the last two, two and a half years. And that's likely to grow in the world's cheapest market for data. Uh, and what will be Geo's ambitions post uh, this tie up with Facebook and uh, others would be quite an interesting thing to see. Um, coming to uh, Hong Kong uh, and uh, another topic to, and it's not just uh, looking at Hong Kong, but Sherry, um, you have all you have uh, this experience of looking at how Hong Kong has ex uh, 
handle this situation, but also uh, we have been talking about the general digital banking payments landscape. Uh, William briefly touched about the uh, you know health tech and healthcare side of things. Um, so it would be good to understand from what you feel has been the uh, response of the market from an insurance perspective and the insure tech perspective. And of course, about how you've seen uh, Hong Kong respond to it and we'll also get King's view on this post that. Great. Thank you for the question. Um, I would speak from my interactions and experiences with our portfolio companies. So I think the number one impact to the fintech startups is definitely on cash flow. Um, for startups that are tight on cash, they have to, and we encourage them to make sure that there's a reasonably long runway, uh, meaning 12 to 18 months during an economic downturn. So startups are surely putting more efforts into managing both their fundraising schedule and cost-cutting measures. And by cost-cutting, it means renegotiating uh, payment terms and leases with your suppliers, your buyers, and your landlord. Um, here in Hong Kong, and luckily here at Hong Kong Science and Technology Park, uh, we, we did over a six-month full rental waiver since April this year. So to alleviate the operational pressures for our, some of our startups and to help them retain our R&D talent. Uh, but at the same time, a portion of our portfolio companies are actually still quite early stage, uh, working on R&D and product development. So for these startups, as long as they maintain a healthy control in expenses, they are less impacted. So they can even take this opportunity to harness talents. And for some of our insured tech portfolio companies, like William just mentioned, um, they even benefit from this market dynamic. Uh, because people's awareness of healthcare increased and you know more people access to digital health platform. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. Um, King, just uh, you know, on Hong Kong's response, we, we've been in the middle of this for uh, almost seven months or uh, six months now, uh, right? Uh, since uh, January, but you know, we returned to a fairly normal situation very quickly, I would, I would say. We never had a full lockdown as uh, other countries have had. Uh, and uh, FinTech has been something that we've been looking for changes. Um, one of the questions on the panels as well as this channel is that the virtual banks are now going live. We have had new licenses for uh, uh, insure tech uh, players as well uh, by the Hong Kong regulator. So how have you seen the initial response? Are we seeing changes on the ground on what has been largely a cash economy or an octopus plus cash economy? Uh, what are the changes you've seen from the Hong Kong uh, fintech landscape? Well, um, it's a uh, complex question in a way, because uh, there are just so many different segments of companies. And uh, I would like to echo to uh, Sher Sherry's point. It really depends on what stage and the nature of the company <laughs> is. So I guess in the interest of time, I would just want to quickly highlight uh, three types of companies that uh, we came across. <clears throat> so obviously, the first the first type uh, is what uh, Sherry described. They're still uh, relatively in the early stage, uh, still in the build up building up mode. Uh, that includes you know the eight virtual banks and also uh, some of the uh, uh, incoming uh, digital insurers. Now, interestingly, when we talk to these folks, you know, big and small, uh, like uh, the virtual bank, like the, the ZA, you know, I mean, the bow tie of the world. Now, basically, they were just saying that. Over the past year, they've been working remotely from home, and they were just half jokingly saying that uh, ZA, for example, they are probably the only virtual bank on the planet that basically build up the entire operation with all the all the staff working from home. So uh, it is happening, and uh, so that for, for that segment, they're doing fine. Now the second segments of companies are the I would say the B two B solution providers in which the solutions are already uh, mature enough mm -hmm. to go to market. So the, for, for those that have already begun the, the BD process, so I just want to perhaps uh, cite one example to put things in context. So there's a company called Echelmon. It's a wealth tech company. And uh, so they've been doing all these like robot advisory kind of platform that they mostly focus their energy in uh, providing the platform to the medium sized uh, banks in Hong Kong. Obviously, some of them are larger in size, but by and large, the mid sized banks. And since they already closed the deal before the pandemic hits, so they've been doing reasonably well because at the end of the day, you know, by having this capability 
for the medium-sized banks, then you know, the banks are able to, in a way, maintain a certain level of service quality, right, in terms of you know, client advisory. So, so in this particular group of companies, they are also doing the reasonably okay, all right? Now, the third group of companies would be the ones that is in the different areas of B2C. So it can be payments, uh, it can be um, <clears throat> lending, uh, and so on. Now, and for this, uh, I think, the, I think the, the experience for these guys are all over the place. Now, some of them uh, have been uh, doing reasonably well in other parts of the world, because I just spoke with the, the country manager of a Singaporean-based uh, payments company that just set up shop in Hong Kong last year. So, so they have all the plan in place and um, pretty ambitious ones too. So both B2C lending and also SME lending. Now, but because of COVID, they basically had to put everything uh, on hold because of the whole sort of the consumer facing mm -hmm. elements that you just have to stop. Now, so I think, I think all in all, I would say that because of the, just the mix that we have, because Hong has been growing the ecosystem for quite some time, we have a relatively uh, diverse mix of companies. So all in all, I think we are doing okay. And for the ones that are still uh, hurting, so again, from a government standpoint, we're trying to do the best we can to help them in terms of government subsidies, you know, get them more information, business introductions, uh, you know, connections with VCs and whatnot. So we're just doing the best we can to help the funds of those who are in need. Thank you, King. Uh, Will, coming back to you, um, the next one would be with regards to, you know, we've, we've seen the landscape, we've seen an impact on uh, overall fintech. Largely, people are bullish on certain sections, but things like in India, when we spoke about, you know, uh, lending uh, has got badly impacted, payments got impacted. And we also saw quite a few well-funded startups uh, decide to furlough people uh, or and in a couple of cases globally even shut down, right? Um, how has been the, and Amit uh, in the presentation also showcased what's been the investment landscape over the last six months, but on the ground, right? Uh, how have you seen that impact investors specifically when it comes to FinTech, right? Have they, um, you know, st uh, reduced their funding uh, or investment rather, or have they uh, increased it? Or if they have, what has been the changes uh, you, you guys have done as well as what are you seeing in the industry locally uh, on mainland? Okay, um, well, I think the, <laughs> the good news is that uh, when we have, well, again, I cannot say that I talked to everybody, but at least for those investors that I got a chance to talk to over the past few months. Now, by and large, I think the sentiment uh, has been uh, quite consistent. So investors have been uh, more cautious than before. So uh, they would be looking at the companies, whether they're more, I would say, resilient or post-COVID uh, ready, uh, which is kind of like a, like a new metric for investment, if you will. Uh, so, so definitely they're more cautious. Now, but then are they scaling back? At least from what uh, we have seen, uh, they have not. So obviously, I think the ones that are more active, like AMTD, I'm sure that many of you might be uh, sort of seeing the news about AMTD acquisition, investment, almost like every month. So uh, AMTD is still very active. Uh, and then uh, we also talked to uh, uh, other, I would say, incubators slash uh, you know, early stage investor like Betatron, for example. So they are launching the next cohort. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, this month. So, uh, so each company that will be investing in, in them are half a million US. <clears throat> and then there are other investors that I, I don't want to steal thunder. I would like uh, perhaps uh, Sherry to share uh, her observations too. But basically, for uh, Sabah Port and Science Park, uh, the government funded organizations, uh, they have the, the mandates to co-invest with private investor, but then they, they definitely have a lot of gunpowder uh, you know, waiting to be deployed. So, so all in all, yes, it's more cautious, but at the same time, we're also seeing a uh, different level of uh, investment activities. Um, William, uh, what is what about the state of play uh, in mainland China? What are we seeing as the models of investment and what has been the general trend when it came to investing over the last five months? I'll come to what's the trend for the future in a little bit. Okay, so to be very frank, most of my fintech investments right now are, um, you know, I just did four uh, in, since December uh, and they're on blockchain fintech. So they're sort of 
border agnostic. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're focused on uh, blockchain fintech back in 2015, 2016 with BitMEX. Uh, we got, uh, we did four investments. Um, BitMEX is uh, reportedly uh, worth $8 billion as of two years ago based on their profit. Uh, and then we took a bit of a break from blockchain fintech. Uh, we revisited, I came back to it at the end of last year because I think it's time for products in this area. It's a bit, um, you know, well, it's a bit strange for a traditional equity, you know, investing VC like me uh, to go into this area. Uh, but, uh, you know, we invest, we take equity, uh, and we think that uh, the, the, the digit, move to digitization uh, has been very, very positive. Um, crypto investment uh, trading volumes have tripled over the last year uh, and time for products there. Uh, so overall, we're pretty bullish on the product side of crypto fintech. In terms of, you know, traditional stuff, um, you know, we haven't seen a whole lot of movement within China. Uh, I think there's a lot more action outside. Uh, the bigger have gotten huge in China and, uh, you know, the, there's, uh, there's not a lot of uh, space. Um, probably more in insurance, uh, which is where we have the care voice and startup care. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, we haven't really seen, uh, you know, the payments pretty much done, right? Um, you know, micro loans, uh, P2P is gone and the, the loans pretty much done. So, you know, the, what's left? Uh, uh, it's all about the products. And where is, uh, you know, what kind of investment are you seeing? Are you seeing early stage investments happening? Because the general data seems to be that it's slowed down, uh, especially, I mean, naturally because of the lockdowns, there was one uh, slowdown, but general data seems to be indicating that there was a significant slowdown in overall funding on mainland China as compared to 2019. So any views from the ground in terms of what's happening? Is it more uh, like uh, King mentioned, a lot of gunpowder uh, being kept aside for further investments? Or is just a case of, okay, let's just wait and see what happens to the industry before we change things? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, it's like six months of history. So I'll just try and do it really quickly. But what happened is, you know, everybody goes on break for Chinese New Year. So a lot of deals get done before Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year. Then after people kind of come back and the things are negotiated and finally get closed. So that happened. Uh, so you had January, February was down. Year over year, it was down pretty significantly. And then March came back up also pretty significantly. And this is across the board, across industries, basically because deals that got negotiated before the Lunar New Year got done. So what's happened since then, um, you know, not, not, not a whole lot. Like deals are happening. I'd, I'd say you're seeing later stage deals and, 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 and this is a, across Asia, early stage deals more than sort of that mid stage. Um, and, uh, you know, fintech uh, in China, uh, as I just mentioned, is not, uh, as far as I know, the most popular sector right now. You know, it's down, it, it is popular, it's in the top 10, but it's like number nine, number 10, in terms of where people are focusing at this point. Thank you. Karthik, what do you see happening uh, in India? Like what happened? I mean, it would be good for the audience to understand how things change from an investment landscape. Uh, quite a bit of, as Bill was pointing, would have been potentially deals negotiated uh, previously, but what are you seeing uh, generally as a trend uh, in the investment side? And what are you guys as Chirate, uh, how are you approaching this for investing currently? Sure, so in, in general, uh, I, I think the most uh, most investors reactions have been to focus inwards and look at existing investments and look at what are the risks there and make sure that they are well set up for success. And as I think somebody else was pointing out, to look at their cash runways, ensuring that they are in, in a good position. Uh, and having said that, I think in terms of new investments, it's a very natural reaction to take a pause and look inwards, which is what the market has pretty much done, especially during the lockdown. Uh, but new investments are taking place uh, far and few, of course. Uh, but interestingly, I think uh, two, three segments where Clearly, there has been a positive impact of COVID, which pretty much has created an inflection point for many of these companies which were waiting for consumer adoption to happen, be it in the ed tech space or in uh, some elements of SaaS, where I think investments, new investments as well, not just the deals which have already been negotiated pre-COVID, are also taking place. FinTech in general, uh, it has uh, taken a slow 
path. And as William has pointed out in China, similar in India as well, I think in terms of new deals, uh, clearly lending is something which everyone's waiting and just checking out what's happening. Uh, so lending is far from investments coming through, but technology and uh, product uh, oriented companies uh, are uh, being looked at. This also includes how, you know, if I take an example, how insurance is more and more personalized and how can you use data which you're actually having to personalize and customize insurance as, as one example. And somebody talked about Setu as an example, which is trying to create opportunities for consumer companies to uh, create more financial product access. I think these are explorations which are continuing to happen, uh, but investments will continue to be far and few, at least for the next one or two months, purely from the perspective that investors early stage typically expect to meet the teams uh, in person. I, I think it's more of a uh, subjective call that one takes. So to that extent, that definitely is a limiting factor, uh, but everyone's also trying to figure out ways to overcome that. And that's what venture investors are and entrepreneurs are, which are eternal optimists. So we at Shirate also are looking at how do we actually uh, keep doing that? And if, if the entrepreneur in the, is in the same city, then we can of course meet them with appropriate social distancing norms. But if they're in a different city, then can we partner and that with somebody who is in that uh, city. And earlier, a co-investor would be co-opted for strategic purpose, and here it is for, this is the strategic purpose. So these are some of the ways, you know, everyone's adapting to it. Sorry. You're literally doing their job for them. Um, yeah. One of the things with uh, Zoom, right? The social distancing goes away, but you can't control who's talking. Um, Thank you, Karthik. I think that's pertinent. But just a quick follow-up question would be post-COVID, right? Uh, which we hope is sooner than later. Uh, but let's assume there is a new normal that is achieved. There is a way that um, the country has uh, figured out a way to handle with it, uh, you know, maybe through treatments, vaccines, whatever, and get a grip on that. What would be for you the key sectors in fintech to invest in? Uh, say, let's say 2021, if you had to target your key investment sectors, what would they be? I think within fintech, it would be a lot more product innovation, uh, and and uh, it would also be technology which is powering, uh, uh, you know, finance and payments, uh, and a lot more infra technology, a lot more SaaS uh, solutions. Uh, so more more on the enterprise side to a large extent. I think consumer fintech is something where. Uh, I think there is enough which is already there in the market. One is looking at how do these scale up and more customizable solutions in terms of fintech is another solution one, one could look at uh, from a consumer standpoint. Thank you. Sherry, coming to you uh, and you know King also is looking at it. So two points, one in terms of uh, HKSTP ventures, how has your, been, your approach been to investment? You know, when, it, when you are looking at a, uh, a government-backed fund in some senses, there are certain other uh, priorities for you, not just you know large profit making or exits, uh, but what are the areas, A, how have you dealt with the, you know, the lockdown and uh, impact on FinTech in terms of your investments? And secondly, what are the areas that you are looking to target in the coming months from an investment perspective that you feel will grow? Great, thank you. Uh, so I think on the VC investment side, uh, we are very open, optimistic and you're right and King is right. Uh, as, a, as a VC fund with government, uh, uh, as an LP, uh, we, we do have the drive power to invest and we do have the mission to encourage our co-investor co partners to invest. Um, and uh, not just for the vision, and we are also very financially driven because our co co-investment co partners will be financially driven as well. Uh, and of course, the investment activity would not be as crazy as the last two years because of the limited travel and VC will have to reserve more of its capital to existing portfolio companies. Uh, but my personal experience is that VC is still pretty active. Um, and in terms of areas that we will look for, um, 
to be very honest, uh, we, and I think most of the VCs out there are still mapping out uh, the investment strategy post-COVID for fintechs. Uh, but in general, I think if um, you hold the belief that, you know, the, at least for us, we hold the belief that the future trend of fintech will be guided by the new world of banking and insurance fragmentation, then COVID-19 will only mean that you know, COVID-19 will accelerate this transformation because customer will have a much higher expectation on digital experience, but the incumbents will not be able to respond to this higher expectation as fast as fintech startups. So fintech startups will capture the values that where Gen Z will bank ads and traditional banks will turn itself probably to backbone infrastructure uh, support. So under this big framework, um, I think, you know, we will look at tech startups that would help banks, insurance to compete on operational efficiencies. So, you know, enterprise solutions. Um, companies uh, to mention uh, in Hong Kong would be Final Labs and Cluster AI that, that would be good examples. Um, another segment we will look at will be startups that would generally facilitate open banking. So 40% of the banks in APAC start having API platforms to permit customers to share their own transaction data with third parties. So companies like Bino Forti, Planto in Hong Kong. Um, yeah. And finally, yeah. I will conclude with the last point that, you know, because of the increased awareness of health, uh, insure tech companies that can make or notch uh, their policyholders to become healthier will be something that is easy as well. Okay. Let's hope that's the case. We hope, I think InsurTech definitely is some, a space that people are looking for. And we do ideally hope that the incumbents can also respond, but I, I guess the agility is always going to be a point, right? So Chandan, as a FinTech, uh, albeit uh, an older FinTech, uh, what are you guys looking to respond and how are you seeing the new landscape, right? Uh, on one hand, from a payments perspective, if uh, volumes go back to uh, pre-COVID uh, levels or at least close to COVID levels, uh, then there's obviously a, a build that you can continue. As you mentioned previously, you know, you've, as a MobiQuick, you've hired people, so which is a good sign uh, in this economy. Uh, what are your focuses going forward and how do you see the industry adapting to this new normal and taking things further for India's 700 million uh, uh, internet users who are slowly getting onto the digital payment landscape? So, uh, uh, I would like to split the question uh, into two parts. One is B2B space, you know, how, uh, you know, we as a payment partner for other companies, we add value there uh, in the ecosystem. So, uh, during, I would say during this period, uh, uh, there has been a lot of interest, inbound interest, I would say, from companies that we don't even expect, you know, which is, uh, you know, large retail organizations, for example, uh, uh, to consider uh, launching digital, uh, you know, payment services, you know, so white label products, if they can get their own wallet, they are not experts, uh, you know, in, in that, but uh, they have been, uh, you know, we've been uh, exploring a lot of opportunities in that space. And I think in next, uh, you know, few months, uh, uh, you know, we will be announcing uh, some of those things as well, where effectively what we are doing is we are powering uh, already acquired users of large, uh, large organizations and we provide them a platform where they can uh, retain them they can engage them you know they can uh, nudge them as uh, sherry said uh, you know at the right time for insurance uh, you know uh, if they want to launch so that creates two things one is uh, most of these people they uh, uh, you know uh, their, their user retention improves secondly you can add uh, additional lines lines of revenue as well effectively uh, uh, you know everybody wants to be owner. So again, UPI as it is, uh, uh, you know, it's an open platform. Anybody, anyone can uh, start accepting payments via UPI uh, straightforward uh, and adding a top layer of it, top layer of the product in which you can handle the user data, you know, high influx of user data. Uh, so people are approaching us to provide, uh, you know, some of these services. Uh, to B2B partners, uh, in a, uh, you know, via our APIs or, uh, you know, uh, providing a white label product uh, straightforward. So that is like B2B perspective. So a lot of interest is coming in uh, uh, from our partners. Uh, second is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, from customer perspective, we are seeing a lot of traction, you know, so earlier it used to be the case that uh, 
you know so so we also launched uh, you know uh, on our platform corona insurance uh, in partners a partnership with couple of uh, you know insurers uh, you know at the beginning of uh, the crisis and uh, it did uh, pretty well we provided uh, free corona insurance to all our uh, you know employees as well uh, so so uh, so what's happening is that all the users who are uh, who are uh, you know they are also coming up with ideas and pushing us to innovate now uh, for us users is uh, some of these uh, companies as well online e-commerce companies uh, earlier it used to be the case that uh, we used to push them with new products that to improve the flow to improve the customer journey you know that we used to come back with them uh, you know with ideas that how can we increase the uh, success rate of a transaction or you know decrease drop rates and all those things but now uh, du during the crisis the thought process has changed you know people are i think everyone has used three or four months to analyze the inefficiencies uh, you know operational inefficiencies in their businesses and now they are coming up with ideas that uh, how can we improve the flow you know how can we uh, increase the success rate you know so those kind of uh, things are happening so i see uh, that the trend will definitely continue and it's all good for uh, you know payment uh, companies which are uh, payment partners uh, you know like us which are uh, who are there in the space for a long period in time uh, and deep rooted in the indian uh, you know indian uh, fintech ecosystem you know so uh, that's that's like the broad uh, broad trend thank you chandan um before we go to the questions uh, one question to all the panelists uh, i'll go one by one uh, is um, your views on uh, cross border impact right on uh, of covid-19 on cross border on fintech right we're just talking about is it enabling is it stopping and let's let's start with uh, king uh, hong kong has always been the super connector between uh, uh, asian countries and fintech has been one of our backbone so how are you seeing that happen uh, from a how about what's the landscape you're seeing right now for cross border fintech collaboration or movement well um the the short answer is uh, it depends because again there are different segments uh again uh, i've been so looking at my so personal experience in dealing with uh, the different fintechs uh, coming to us where we can offer them help so obviously the payments the remittances uh, companies there's just so many of them from all from all angles um so i think that that is still very much more active than i expected uh, to uh, to be honest so that that trend is still happening obviously covid uh, has uh, put some of their plans on hold uh, but that, again given the size of hong kong as a as a uh, as a city the amount of uh, you know cross border transactions is just enormous now but the other thing i just want to quickly highlight is um the digital asset space in fact uh, over the past uh, few months I've been uh, having so many Zoom calls uh, with uh, folks from the U.S. Uh, in fact, I just uh, had a call uh, with Israel about uh, companies in the digital asset space. Some of them want to be, uh, in a way, branching out of their activities uh, to include Asia uh, in their portfolio, and they definitely see Hong Kong, particularly with the uh, upcoming uh, license for crypto exchange uh, offered by SFC. Uh, so people are hopeful to see uh, some licenses to be given out uh, this year. So that, in a way, has created quite a lot of uh, enthusiasm and uh, positive expectation. So as a result, uh, from a, uh, it's not exactly cross-border per se, but since crypto is traded basically globally, uh, so that's why a lot of these international players are now uh, seriously looking at Hong Kong. And uh, again, looking at my own personal experience, in the last 12 months, definitely in the last, I would say now it's, it's July, the last three months, I have met so, I met virtually so many like digital assets company from all around the world, particularly hey, US and Israel and so on. Yeah, so the momentum is quite strong. Yeah, thank you. Shari, anything to add from uh, what Science Park is looking, especially considering you look at more deep tech? You've had some very smart AI companies uh, come out of. Uh, Science Park as well as some Rectech. So, what are you? What are your views on uh, the cross-border uh, fintech movement? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I think uh, Kang already gave a really good answer, um, but I would just have a small point to add. Uh, I mean, given the China-U.S. tension and more Chinese companies coming to Hong Kong for IPO, 
uh, Ken mentioned, the momentum for cross-border investments is definitely still there. Uh, and particularly, uh, we highlight on the startups where their use case is, you know, kind of the ap application and use case is global. Um, for example, we see a trend of more investments going into enterprise solution startups, uh, where they usually have a cross-border application where they're, they're not bound by um, a geography. And those startups are usually also supported by core technology like AI machine learning. And there have been like uh, investments from of like 7 billion uh, in Q1 of 2019 to 10 billion of investments um, in Q1 2020 just for B2B fintech startups. Uh, and also a good example to mention in Hong Kong would be uh, Air Wallex actually backed 116 million Series D in April uh, to expand their cross-border financial product portfolio. So just a small point to add. I think that also combines well with what we're seeing with the AMDD's acquisitions in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, and a couple of moves in locally. Uh, William, uh, there was a question, so I'm, I'm borrowing from that question as well as talking about it um, in terms of the expansion of Chinese fintech companies in Asia, which has largely been ASEAN plus a bit of the Middle East. Um, what are you seeing uh, with that continue? Uh, and uh, a, a top up uh, question on that has been, uh, do you think that the Asian fintech landscape is homogeneous? <laughs> okay, so the first thing is that, um, you know, the, the Chinese fintechs tried to go to Southeast Asia to do P2P loans and they all got shut down, right? So Indonesia said, uh-uh, not going to do it here. Uh, Malaysia, there's a bunch, um, but for the most part, it's been, tip, you know, very, very tough. Um, I don't think that uh, the, uh, the fintech space in Southeast Asia has been really fertile soil for the, the Chinese coming down. Um, you know, Alibaba has done reasonably well because they came in early and they're big and people wanted their support. But for the small guys, um, you know, it, it didn't translate too well and there was a lot of local backlash. Uh, in, in terms of cross-border, uh, we are, you know, SOSV, but for trying to accelerate our MOX, which I run with Oscar, I mean, we're focused, we do cross-border. Our tagline is like cross-border internet. Uh, so we're big fans. And I think the, you know, the opportunity for Hong Kong, which is now more and more, um, I guess, unfortunately, part of China, um, you know, we invested in, in BitMEX. We helped them expand outside of Hong Kong. Uh, they became the most uh, valuable startup in the history of Hong Kong, uh, according to the press, and not based on a, on a VC valuation, but based on their net income. Um, so we're huge fans of cross-border. Um, innovation uh, doesn't really have borders, and we hopeful, we're hopeful, very hopeful that uh, the decoupling that's starting to happen um, is broken down by technology. Uh, so we're huge supporters of that, especially because you know we're the first accelerator in Asia, uh, run by a bunch of uh, non um, you know non Chinese uh, operating out of, of Shanghai and Taipei and, and Shenzhen, uh, and uh, now Delhi and KL. So. Thanks, Will. I'm going to come to Karthik. Karthik, uh, we know each other from our uh, engineering days. I won't tell people how many years back the, that is. But we met uh, post-engineering, you know, about 10, 12 years in Hong Kong because you were here uh, for uh, speaking to some investors and looking at some portfolio companies. So cross-border is, is, is inherently there in Chirate's uh, you know, investment thesis in some senses. So how are you seeing that cross-border fintech taking place? Um, a lot of Indian companies are keen to take their model and expand to ASEAN and the Middle East where they feel it's very fertile for their application uh, minus UPI, but still uh, there's that push, especially in B2B. So what are your views on cross-border fintech? So specifically within fintech, I, I think uh, given the current environment that uh, is in everywhere, I guess consumer startups, I, I think there will be some uh, delays and lags where most of the consumer fintech companies will be mostly inward focused, but technology companies where their yeah, you know core products definitely there is a, a lot of scope for that, which continues to happen uh, because the large markets are global in nature and and the uh, opportunity set is actually global. So I, I would actually distinguish from consumer companies and non-consumer companies in terms of their uh, approach. In, in the short to medium term. Yeah, thank you. 
Chanan, um, I'm going to just turn tracks a little bit uh, and get your viewpoints on uh, the ecosystem overall, right? Um, how are we uh, doing uh, on a cross-border interaction perspective, right? As a large fintech base in India, how do you work with partners who are coming in from uh, overseas or uh, when you are looking at plans to go overseas or, you know, if you have those entities overseas, how do you guys interact? What are the key elements that some of the other fintechs are looking to go cross-border need to be aware of, especially uh, when they're coming into India or dealing with Indian fintech? Right. So, uh, <clears throat> The way, uh, so as a company, uh, you know, we are uh, about to launch in, uh, you know, one of the, you know, countries here in Nepal, uh, you know, uh, first international partnership, uh, you know, for us, uh, which will be announced, uh, uh, which will be launched. But apart from that, as a company, we haven't uh, really explored, uh, you know, for ourselves, we haven't explored, uh, you know, other international partnerships. However, we are getting approached now by a lot of companies, uh, I would say, in fact, in uh, uh, in uh, Africa as well, where a uh, lot of the products and services that we have built, they are looking for us to provide them uh, or maybe power for them, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in better partnerships. Another inbound uh, interest, I would say, in terms of investments uh, is coming in, is happening as, uh, as William was mentioning about BitMEX. You know, so cryptocurrencies, they are seeing a lot of traction in last, uh, you know, in last... Uh, three to four months here in India, since the uh, government regulation, you know, uh, Supreme Court order, which came out and uh, suddenly significant volume of transactions have started picking up. And uh, we, have, we have also received a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, interest from people across the world who want to come back, come to India because we are a payment partner. You know, we are a payment partner to all businesses. And uh, we have seen uh, that that segment also grow significantly. And uh, uh, so in, inbound interest to acquire more Indian customers and, uh, you know, for cryptocurrencies that is significantly happening. And I, I believe that in next, uh, you know, next few uh, months or, uh, or year, we'll see, uh, you know, a significant consolidation in that space uh, as the market matures here with the right kind of regulation, which is, uh, you know, being provided by, I would say, the government. So uh, that's, that's uh, kind of about it. It's so, yeah, William Wong. A fiat on ramp for crypto in India. Sorry. Are you willing to be a fiat on ramp? Uh, so from uh, rupee rupees to Bitcoin uh, in India for your customers, is that uh, something we can uh, turn on? A fiat on ramp rupees to uh, Bitcoin. I wouldn't like to answer it here. <laughs> He's taking his, pleading his second amendment. Oh, right. Uh, well, William, the, one of the things that's happening right now in the Indian uh, crypto landscape is that the, um, there is a report or uh, pending in for the, with the government, right? Where the... So just, to, uh, just to clarify on that, uh, uh, as a wallet, uh, you know, we are, uh, Mobiquip wallet is powering payments on, I would say, 70 to 80% of the crypto exchanges here in India. We are powering payments for that. I'll connect you guys post the, uh, the panel for uh, what can be done. So my closing uh, question, rather than uh, the question, it's about what would be uh, a company you think has uh, really showcased itself uh, during COVID-19 and is going to come out stronger as we uh, move forward, right? Other than uh, companies you've already mentioned, uh, will. I would leave BitMEX out of that, uh, but any other companies other than your own firm or ones you've mentioned, what do you think is going to be the strong, uh, what have you seen as in your local uh, jurisdictions uh, as a strong fintech player who has uh, showcased their products well, service their customers and are going to come out stronger uh, on the other side of 2020. So let's start with uh, William. Okay, I got a really weird one. Uh, so. Uh, our company is that uh, um, was a registered lender, or they are, sorry, they are a registered lender in Indonesia. Uh, and now they're one of the 33 uh, companies in Indonesia to have a full lending license, uh, P2P. Uh, and so one of the things that they developed uh, using some pretty cool algorithms is a distributed sort of decentralized crowdsourced uh, collection platform. Um, so the challenge with all these small loans 
uh, and uh, is actually collecting the money. Uh, and so they've uh, built this platform. And the interesting thing is that they've made the platform available to the industry. Um, they're not really charging so much for it. It's more like a, a bit of a service. And when I say collections, it's not a bunch of mafia guys with like baseball bats. It's, it's more like um, as a, a, a nudges, okay? It's more like, a, hey, um, you know, people in the community can nudge you to pay back. Uh, so it's crowdsourced collections of loans. It seems to be working very well. So if anybody needs um, uh, to, to nudge their uh, customers to pay back, uh, please get in touch with uh, Pin Jam Win Win. Thank you, William. Sherry, what have you been seeing? Something in the insurance space, you think, that you want to mention? Uh, sure. Uh, I will highlight a final lab a Hong Kong-based company, an NLP solution for banks and insurers uh, in the languages of Cantonese, Singlish, and other SEA languages. Um, they're definitely a good example of how they are benefit from the acceleration of digital transformation because of COVID-19. Uh, indeed, they recently won a contract with government body for their call center because of a very interesting reason. Uh, a lot of the government branches shut down because of due to COVID-19, so the call center got a huge lot more traffic um, uh, that their existing manpower cannot handle. So they had to turn to this fintech company for help in order to automate the calls. Um, so this is one example I've mentioned. Another quick example, just name it, is uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, there's a company called HKTV Mall, a homegrown yeah. online shopping platform, <laughs> who announced that earlier that they would develop their own e wallet. So it's very interesting, you know, kind of example of like fintech turning to tech fin where, you know, e-commerce companies starting to build their own banking products and stuff. Yeah, that going back to the Alipay model, right? Uh, where Ant Financial build this out. Uh, very, very interesting. Yeah. Karthik, uh, what, what, I, what, what from you would be that one interesting company you'd like to highlight? I think going by the flavor of uh, this conversation of cross-border, I will highlight a company called Crystal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually cross-border with presence in Hong Kong, Singapore, India, in the digital wealth management space, which I feel, uh, you know, now with more and more uh, people looking at opportunities across the globe, I think that's one company where there would be quite some interest. Thank you. King, what would you think if you had to name another Hong Kong company? <laughs> well, I guess uh, I would be... Uh... Uh, going off uh, a different uh, angle to answer this question. Instead of naming one particular company, I would uh, like to uh, pick on one sub-segment that uh, I believe uh, together with my colleagues, we believe uh, will do well over the next uh, 18 months or so. And that is the B2A segment in the insure tech space. So there's a business to agents uh, uh, angle. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because I think for those of you uh, who have been following, I'm sure this happens in, in other parts of the world. It's just that uh, in Hong Kong, uh, it is, it's a pretty you know, dense market from an insurance standpoint. So a lot of uh, any premiums being, uh, being written. But uh, interestingly, because of the, the le legacy uh, reason, you know, a big chunk of the, I believe to my recollection, Hong Kong uh, sold something like uh, 500 billion Hong Kong dollars of any premiums every year, uh, yeah. but then a, a lion's share, like 80% of them or more, uh, were sold uh, via the insurance agents. So, you know, face to face. Now, so now, of course, with the COVID, then uh, all these things are almost like granted or halt, uh, at least in the past few months. So as a result, uh, anything, any technology that can still allow the insurance companies, particularly the insurance agents to, to carry on the business, is going to be a big win. So of course, I think in the past uh, two months, the local authority has been rushing out some new regulation, allowing remotes, you know, uh, you know, logging of the conversation, so that mm -hmm. in a way the insurance company can can then transact online. So anything along those lines over the next eighteen months uh, would be a good uh, good win in terms of going very very good attraction. Channel, last word to you. We are on dot uh, with finishing. So 30 seconds. One company other than Moby Quick, if you had to pick, who will come out of this stronger? Channel, you're on mute. 
Yeah, so in uh, at tech space, uh, there is a company called uh, you know Doubtnut. You know, so they, uh, uh, I think uh, Karthik will uh, uh, will be able to share more details about it. But uh, the point is, uh, it significantly benefited because all the students and uh, you know children were working from home. It it's the, as the name says, Doubtnut. You know, so it it helps you solve your doubt. You know, uh, you can ask questions uh, from the app, and uh, you get answers. Uh, for simple problems which uh, you know uh, school uh, school going kids or students have uh, the model uh, for them it was not really uh, you know they were not looking to generate a lot of revenue but i think uh, they ended up acquiring i would say around 25 to 30 million customers in 3 to 4 uh, months of lockdown because suddenly you know few million to uh, 25 30 it's significant uh, you know uh, scaling scale up which happened and it really uh, gives an idea about uh, how Things can change suddenly for uh, uh, you know uh, for any business, and I think it's in talks to be acquired by uh, you know large uh, ad tech company here in India for a, a few hundred million dollars. Just a matter of three four months. Right time, right place, and right growth. So thank you all. It's been a pleasure having you. It's been a lot of insights, a lot of learning for me as well. Uh, understanding the three landscape, I think the audience has learned quite a bit from insights across investment, what are fintech companies doing yourselves and what's happening across border. We hope that things turn uh, positive going forward and we can see the renaissance of fintech uh, 3.0, as I call it, uh, before the tech fins take over uh, in 2025. So thank you all. Thank you again to Medici for uh, uh, hosting us on our live platforms across uh, various uh, streams. And uh, please uh, feel free to come and join us on the virtual fintech fair which is virtualfintechfair.com. So take care and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Bye.